Okay, so um, in today's webinar, um, we're going to talk about multi domain product architecture. You know, interestingly, I was discussing with one of my colleagues last week, and uh, he kind of told me that uh, well, he does not even understand the title, so I, I think I will clarify what we mean by multi domain. Okay. So, like uh, Samuel said, I'm uh, Pascal Vera and uh, working uh, for Siemens. Uh, especially or specifically uh, Siemens Digital Industry Software. I will also uh, you know, have time to do a quick introduction of my company. And I'm in charge of product management um, at Siemens for uh, the MBSC and ALM units. All right, so let's start. Um, and uh, like I said, um, I think uh, I'm due to clarify what we mean by multi domain product application. So, like I was uh, telling at the beginning, I talked to uh, some of my colleagues last week, and then you know some of them tell me, "Well, no, we got to clarify what you mean by that." Uh, and uh, it was like, uh, you know, what do you mean by domain? What do you mean by architecture? So it was a kind of kind of puzzling words, and we know um, these words are you know, subject to, uh, to debates and what they mean. Right? So domain and architecture, well. First domain, I mean, it's very simple. You know, you can replace domain in this, uh, in this uh, title by discipline. And discipline means, you know, engineering disciplines like electrical, mechanical, software, hydraulic, etc. So, very simple. Uh, architecture, well, it's a bit more um, complicated to explain, but for this uh, specific webinar, we are really talking about product or product line, which is structured uh, as a representation. And uh, it tends to be, uh, you know, generally as any architecture, domain and implementation agnostic. So when you think about that, normally this architecture will be limited to a functional representation. But as you will see, as a matter of organizing functions, and so we'll talk about logical organization of the functionality. Then my colleague said, oh, I got it. Um, so that's about an architecture representing all engineering disciplines. And no, it is not. So it does not such particles in your representation satisfying all domains. So really what this architecture is, is about specifying you know, what is the expected functional and non-functional capabilities across all disciplines. So a matter and a way of specifying this, and also in return, the capability of mapping all the disciplines and the resulting artifacts. And we're going to spend quite a lot of time explaining that, but at least for a starter, I wanted to explain um, you know, what these uh, words uh, mean in, uh, in context of that. All right, so I'm going to do a quick introduction of my company. So, you know, Siemens started a uh, while ago, also started in a garage, like a uh, few other companies in this world, where, you know, 10 people, you know, we were about like uh, 2,000. Uh, US dollar revenue the first year. Well, we quite uh, evolved since that. Today we are, uh, you know, in a leading position in electrification, automation, and digitalization. A lot of employees, multiple millions at stake, you know, kind of decent profit margin. We also became, you know, a major player in digitalization. You know, interestingly, we are a fairly big uh, software company, you know, over 25,000 engineers. And we are part of the top 10 uh, software companies in the world. Um, for what really concerns, uh, you know, uh, digital industry, uh, well, you know, Siemens is made of operating companies and strategic companies. Like you probably understood by now, I'm part of digital industry, the third one from the left. And uh, as part of digital industry, we have multiple segments, software, factory, automation, motion control, etc. And I'm part of the software division. Okay. So that's my quick introduction for Siemens. And then in this webinar today, um, you know, obviously uh, multi-domain product architecture, matter of starting integrated and stay integrated. And to go through this um, this concept, I'm going to need to talk about integrated uh, model-based system engineering. I'm going to need to explain why it matters to be integrated in BSC. And then uh, we go through, uh, you know, what we are recommending at Siemens as an approach, which is again this multi-domain product architecture. Then we will close this webinar with the benefits of
What happens when a cross product design flaw goes undetected? Design? When it's in complex, interrelated electrical, mechanical, and software systems, a small flaw can mean big problems and costly recalls. In fact, in 2017 in the U.S., there were nearly 35 million such recalls, costing $3.5 billion in direct costs to manufacturers. Many of these design flaws happen at the discipline boundaries where today's disconnected development processes and discipline-specific tools don't go. In order to catch these cross-boundary problems, designers need 3D mechanical models, materials, databases, electrical logical designs, reliability failure information, and more. And they need to see each discipline's connections and relationships simultaneously to see the cross-discipline problem. This is what we call the digital thread, and it's critical for today's multi-domain products. With it, engineers have the ability to see cross-domain relationships early in the design process, when they're created, and when decisions are made about a product's parts, systems, and functions. The digital thread allows errors to be identified and fixed before a product is produced, which is why Siemens PLM is introducing integrated multi-domain system modeling for Team Center. This uniquely integrated product architecture solution captures the cross-product architecture and gives engineers a cross-domain view of the relationships to see potential problems coming. With Team Center, the cross-domain intersections and potential problems are visible early during front-end design, helping prevent or fix problems when it's cheap and easy before the product is produced. Because the digital thread is integrated with the product lifecycle, it's part of processes like product change, workflow, and variation. The digital thread effectively closes the loop between validation and definition, collapsing the entire product development cycle, moving your organization toward a continuous engineering process. With Team Center integrated multi-domain system modeling and the digital thread it creates, you can start integrated and stay integrated. That's ingenuity for life. I know what you are doing this uh, video. Um, well, a couple of things. First, um, you know, complexity. Um, new. This is the old, uh, you know, mechatronic challenge. This is about uh, you know, dealing with uh, cross-domain dependencies, integrate domains together, and then eventually um, a lot of variations. You know, many of the complex in our products have a lot of variants. You need to deal with, and eventually, what you're trying to do there is to not to duplicate data but enable configuration with the data. Another thing uh, we heard, you know, this is uh, this famous uh, late issue discovery, and everybody knows the more you wait fixing issues, the more it's going to cost you. That's the cost of change, and this is also about uh, shifting left, meaning, um, you know, perform virtual verification as early as possible in the process versus uh, physical testing only. Or not replacing physical testing, you always need that. But eventually try to test much earlier the process using the you know, virtual simulation. Okay. The other thing, digital thread, uh, why it's important? Get data together to establish traceability. Well, eventually a lot of uh, uh, product development is going through changes. So you need to understand the impact of the changes, which is impact analysis. You need, uh, you need that. Why? Why you need that? Because you want to complete, uh, to have complete and accurate changes. And then, not least, um, you know, how do I know uh, if uh, a change is impacting a given product configuration? So you need to be able to understand uh, the impact of changes in context for specific uh, product configuration. This is large scale. Uh, you know, eventually, we talk about uh, millions of data across you know, requirements, functions, medical, physical, and engineering domains. It's growing, and it keeps growing. And this is all across so, you know, uh, artifacts uh, for uh, you know, system engineering and beyond. And then verification validation is also augmenting. There's this little chart there on the, on the right you know, showing the progression of a uh, number of verifications, for instance, in autonomous uh, driving systems. So it's uh, easily reaching the uh, you know, magnitude of millions, as you see. So things that uh, this video did not mention, uh, there's definitely, definitely a shift uh, at his desire 
for you know moving from waterfall to agile, and that's a bit understandable why. And then software content. Um, everybody knows. Somebody said you know a few years ago software is eating the world. Well, this is very true. Uh, software content is increasing very fast, and um, you know many of the traditional uh, traditional mechanical industries have to shift um, to software and become kind of software shops. Uh, and that's uh, that's a difficult. All right, now if, uh, like me, you are talking to engineers you know, in the domains and you're trying to explain the value of MBAC and why you need to get integrated in MBAC, well, sometimes you may have this uh, kind of answer. And um, yes, our engineers are extremely busy, there's no doubt about that. But then at the same time, um, if you are in the journey of uh, you know, convincing your company or your colleagues in the various domains to adopt uh, you know, MBAC. One of the things you need to keep in mind is uh, the major challenge is actually uh, the organization changes that MBAC is implied. It's not just a matter of tools, it's also a matter of people, the way you, know, you are suggesting them to approach you know, concept design, comments, etc., but also processes. And um, so that's the point you know, I wanted to make because. Most of the time, we are pretty much aligned on what it should be, but how to put it in place, how to execute it, has been uh, quite a challenge. All right, so how do we do it at Siemens? Integrated model system engineering. Right there on the screen, you see kind of a taxonomy of uh, what we call MBSC. And it starts by uh, you know, product definition, what product definition is. Well, it's pretty, pretty much you know everything that is uh, you know, domain agnostic, uh, functional. Um, so we talk about features. The products need to realize their requirements. Parameters very important, uh, especially uh, you know related to all aspects of identification. Defining the targets, and then all aspects of uh, you know modeling of uh, functions, systems, and how do you organize uh, these functions, allocate the functions to system, etc. And then how do you drive that from an application perspective? So this is about product definition. Now, why it's important to do a good job of product definition? Well, you know, back to the video, it's a matter of making sure all engineering domains are properly aligned in single specification. Not only that, um, as you know, you work on mechanical, electronics, electrical, etc., you certainly want to make sure um, you are complying. To, for instance, you know, functional interfaces. You know, think about uh, you know, a couple of functions being implemented across domains, and what if the functions and the interface implementation will be different between domains? And the end result could be some integration issues. So we'll get back to that uh, in context of product definition and other On the right, product validation. And at Siemens, you know, we have quite a lot of technology regarding uh, virtual simulation. Um, so we are, you know, kind of, um, you know, recommending, uh, you know, across the global industries to practice simulation very early in the in the product development, and I will show some examples of that. So what you see at the bottom, you know, product lifecycle management, everything from the top is running on top of Team Center PLM. Why you want to do that? Well, there's a number of services, you know, product lifecycle management services you want to leverage. You know, starting by you know, organizing the large scale data. How do you organize execution? How do you organize engineering deliveries? So we talk about integrated product planning execution. How do you automate and cross the main on a large scale for continuous verification and validation? And obviously, uh, all aspects of quality engineering and uh, in a large extent. So it's not just uh, you know, test cases uh, that are functional. This is also about uh, you know, concern for safety, reliability, and security. So that's. Um, the overarching uh, picture uh, on how we uh, uh, propose today in the industry uh, model-based system engineering. And what I'm going to start uh, going through is the uh, product definition aspect. Well, let's start by requirements, because eventually product definition starts with requirements. And uh, as we know, you know, requirements are all over the place. Um, you know, they start from a concept or maybe business. Requirements, there's different types of requirements, performance, integration requirements. Then it 
pretty much each domain, you will find again uh, your specific requirements, you know, electrical, software, etc. Then there's also a matter of, uh, you know, how do you like cascade and decompose these requirements from top to bottom. But at the end of the day, what you really want to establish is, uh, you know, this common representation across domains, regardless if the requirements are in a specific domain or not, but get them together with end-to-end -end traceability, be able to manage their dependencies, and obviously, uh, you know, provide guidance to the multiple engineers dealing with requirements uh, related to cascading and decomposing requirements. So this is about Teams Interactive Workspace Integrity Requirements. What we got there is basically an integrated requirement information model. From there, you know, engineers from various uh, domains um, are interested potentially to some of these requirements. That's where we talk about creating engineering views. So if you are a software engineer, you may not be immediately interested by hydraulic requirements, for instance. Um, so that's, uh, that's a way of uh, filtering you out and creating views for what matters to you. Um, information model on the center, well, you know, again, back to performing impact analysis across all domains or specific configuration, going through, you know, um, configuration of requirements, orchestrate changes of requirements, so you need to understand the dependencies. Traceability in context, I already mentioned that, you know, very important. You know, some requirements may be relevant for some variations in the product, some others may not. So you need to have capability to configure this information model. And then, um, not least, um, you know, clearly, you know, in Team Center, we do realize that not all requirements are necessarily authored in Team Center, and so we integrate with multiple sources. Either we do it through data federation, like you know, using the linked data, or through you know, the traditional requirement exchange, uh, like Reiki. Now, requirement verification, something I'm highlighting there, you know, it's quite important. Um, you know, a lot of my customers, uh, you know, are kind of struggling with that. I think at this point, we are kind of doing a good job defining requirements, organizing them. But then, uh, you know, it goes to orchestrate, uh, you know, further requirement verification, the cross domains, track them, monitor them. Well, this is where I start to be uh, a bit difficult. So I will talk about that uh, later in this presentation. Uh, that's a point I wanted to highlight up front. Requirements verification, it's a big deal. Eventually, you know, many of the industries are looking at automation. And how can we do that? It's uh, something that we do is quite, uh, you know, a big deal. Okay, so enterprise grade requirements verification. Now, if you look at uh, you know how much capability do we have um, at Siemens, well, we've got quite a lot. You know, this is just a summary slide uh, going through the last few releases of Active Workspace, and uh, you know it starts from you know doing a good job and providing a great user experience related to the authoring of requirements, their traceability. Um, you know, obviously enable you know reuse of requirements provide templates so you can, you know, kind of enforce the way you want your engineers to create these requirements. And then uh, import export. And then, you know, as when you look at the, at the bottom, uh, some emerging needs, like, uh, and very important, like integrate parameters to requirements. Uh, you know, when we talk about that in some examples, uh, why it's important to integrate parameters is because parameters are key. Uh, in many aspects, either if they are uh, you know, needed um, for design aspects, you know, could be a geometric uh, uh, characteristics. But they are also very key in terms of you know, uh, you know, setting up uh, a number of simulation and verification. So very important to get this uh, parameter of integration to requirements. Now, um, one of the things that is also emerging, and I want to discuss very quickly is this notion of uh, quality analysis. So traditionally, and I think still today, obviously, uh, a lot of these requirements are written in a natural language. And as we know, uh, you know natural language is by nature uh, ambiguous, could be vague, uh, could be subject to interpretation. And so how do you kind of, uh, you know, do some upfront uh, quality checking these requirements? So I want to show you maybe uh, Video, hopefully you can see it. And what you see right there is you know, basically Teams Interactive Workspace. Uh, we have a simple example of the requirement specification. 
it has a number of requirements. And what I'm performing now is basically a quality check. This quality check is using uh, natural language processing. I'm right there on this uh, specific requirements. And then the system is highlighting you know, a number of things that are very likely incorrect and uh, subject to potential downstream issues. So something I need to I need to correct. So there's this um, table at the bottom, which you know basically I like to me uh, the areas that I need to correct. And as I start correcting, uh, you know I, I can basically uh, clear up uh, these things and then get to a point where my requirement is uh, in a much better shape. Similarly, uh, there's uh, you know this kind of reports if you have a very large spec. And you want to run a report on you know, what are the requirement uh, quality, and basically do that uh, with this report. So what you have seen, by the way, is um, uh, technology uh, from a company called the Reuse Company, partner of Siemens, and that's uh, you know a very important capability, and we're going to keep integrating with the Reuse Company for many aspects of um, requirement analysis, quality check, and potentially traceability. Right, so back to multi-domain product architecture. Um, and you know, you probably heard the, this acronym, uh, RFLP, which stands for Requirement Functional Logic or Physical. Uh, I guess it goes a bit beyond that. Uh, we talk about system specification. And the whole idea, when we talk about product definition, is to bring this information model and the PDM services that could serve all engineering domains downstream. So that's what you see at the bottom of this slide. So engineering domains like system simulation, electrical, electronic, software, etc. How do I come with an information model, which is model-based, that is going to serve all these domains? Why do you want to do that? Well, I want to do that because I want to consistently and you know systematically provide uh, the, the way of planning. I want to provide a way of planning across these engineering domains. I want a consistent way of specifying across all these domains. I want to coordinate. You know, it's going to be a matter of uh, maybe scheduling. There are things you need to do first and second. How do I coordinate all these engineering tasks? Align. When we mentioned, you know, interfaces uh, before, you know, when you got functions and interfaces, you better have to make sure each domain is properly complying to these interfaces in their implementation. Configure, we mentioned that a couple of times. And then in return, there's this matter of getting back the data. You know, all these engineering domains are delivering data, artifacts, you know, proof of validation. You want to get that back in the information model. You want to map these artifacts in context. You want to integrate them in the right place. And why do you want to integrate them? Because eventually, at the end of the day, you're going to need to do a complete product validation. So that's, um, that's the concept of product definition. Um, and then, uh, you know, that's eventually complex, as you can imagine. Uh, you probably experiment that in your companies. You know, it's, uh, you know, R, F, and P, it's uh, a lot of data. And if you are starting uh, this journey of figuring out uh, what information model you should use, well, maybe contact us. You know, we have been spending uh, many years actually figuring out that thing. You know, how do you organize data, you know, considering the values uh, you know, complexity aspects, including configuration, variations, etc. And then keep in mind, this is not just RFLP, it's also you know, about features, parameters, targets, variability, models, field of materials, and more. So that's a lot of things. And um, it's very important, kind of critical, that you get this data properly represented, supporting change, configuration, traceability in context. So you can properly serve you know, your downstream engineers as they need to realize uh, you know, these functions of the system. Now, if you think we are done with the information model I just mentioned before, well, maybe not. Because you know, everywhere I go, it's pretty much like you know, customers have over 100 other applications they need to integrate with. You know, they could later be uh, you know, a system design uh, application, or they could be domain specific applications. So that's why I'm uh, showing some integration worth noting, you know, in various domains, electrical, electronic, software, mechanical. Also mentioning, you know, integrations we do for modeling and simulation, because again, 
Uh, we are a big believer of uh, you know, virtual verification, so a lot of uh, simulation modeling tools involved. And then, uh, not least, uh, you know, it does also a matter of integrating with data outside team center. So we are also providing a framework where we can, uh, you know, integrate data through data federation and still give a representation in the information model I was mentioning before, um, you know, using, using big data for instance. So that's a very important aspect. Now, product definition, um, well, it actually comes with uh, multiple uh, contributing facets, right? Provider, right you know, again, you see this uh, team center information model, you know, multiple facets as a matter of defining uh, the functional aspects, how do you group functions or what's the functional interactions? So we talk about logical and physical, it might be a bit confusing. I think we should rather read that as concept physical, it's not really the end physical. And then operational, think about use cases, uh, functional behavior, think about you know, state machines, sequence diagrams, uh, etc. So how do you, you know, specify the behavior of uh, your functional interactions? Good comments you mentioned already. And then a few other aspects, you know, you need to extend the concern. You, know, you have a matter of uh, figuring out uh, the functional safety aspects. So you know, we talk about functional safety integrated to it. Cyber security as well, which is a kind of emerging concern as well. And um, it comes together in this information model, right? So I guess the reason I bring that slide is sometimes uh, there's a bit of narrow view of what the point definition is. Well, eventually, as I'm showing in that slide, it's multiple facets, you know, starting from requirements, going through use cases, functional, logical, behavior of functions, and then concerns and safety and security. So that has become more together. If you want to do a good job specifying to those three engineering domains, you need all that three together. Okay, so at Siemens, you know, product definition comes with a rich integrated system model capability. Um, I think Sam Green mentioned that in the introduction. We call it system modeling workbench. Anybody familiar with uh, Capella Arcadia will recognize the screenshot. So we have been integrating uh, actually, uh, you know, Capella Arcadia together with Team Center. Why, why do we want to do that? Well, again, it's a matter of defining, analyzing, designing, and validating, you know, from requirements to concept design. And again, integrated to this information model I mentioned multiple times. Uh, out of the box methodology, we talk about Arcadia, if you're familiar with. Then managing the life cycle of the models. You know, not only we are you know, incorporating the model data into team center, but we are also managing the life cycle of the models. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, many models could be developed for any given program. You need to manage their life cycle, manage their use, integrate uh, requirements to the models, as I mentioned before. And then, uh, not least, this integration and this framework is providing interoperability. Uh, you know, as a general culture at Siemens, we aim to be open, meaning that uh, we are certainly leading with an application like SMW, but we are also integrating with third party tools. So think about system and tools, you know, cameos, maps, maps, et cetera. So we do provide a framework that, you know, integrate with these tools. And the interesting piece is that as we integrate with these tools, we give them an equal representation into Team Center. So regardless of the source, if you are, you know, CML source or SMW source, you're going to, you know, uh, consistently represent the functions, the systems, the breakdown, and everything in the same manner as it would be, you know, uh, you know, uh, in it. So I think that's a very important concept because, you know, part of the offering at Siemens is, you know, regardless of the tool you want to use for system modeling, we're going to provide you and enable you make usage of system data, as I mentioned before, especially for those two engineers, for the neutral representation. The last point on this slide, provide services for those two engineering. You know, I'm always asking this question uh, to my customers, you know, why do you want to do system modeling? Why is this important to you? Uh, and sometimes, you know, the, the, the answer is not coming as straightforward as you uh, imagine. Well, one of the key things to do system modeling is to make sure, as you do that, is going to be consumable. Right? Why would you spend so much time defining systems and modeling them? Well, 
the reason you want to do that is certainly to make sure it's going to be a consumption, it's going to be a usage that you can align those two engineering uh, of your product development. That's a very important point. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a quick video, um, kind of preview of uh, the integration of uh, you know, SMW to Team Center. In that uh, example, uh, we are basically uh, showing uh, a requirement change. Uh, so, you know, assume that uh, in that case we have requirements, then uh, we have been managing the same W models. So, when I go to a specific requirement I want to change, what I can see is what is the relative model uh, for this requirement. So, now again, we talk about an SMW model. So, I see the description of this model. And what I can do from there is uh, to look and make sure, you know, is it the right model I'm looking at? So, part of the integration, we integrate all the diagrams of the SMW model. Uh, there's a way there in the interface to look at specific diagrams, feature to the list of diagrams. Then, you know, basically the user will go through the stuff and say, yeah, well, that's exactly uh, what I'm looking at. And what you're going to do next, so what I'm going to do next, for instance, is to establish some collaboration. So part of the integration, you know, we leverage uh, you know, Markup, documentation management, team center. So you can, you know, mark up the models, diagrams, and collaborate with other engineers. From there, and from team center, what I can do as well is to open back the model. Now I'm going to work on the model. So think about this uh, requirement change we just discussed, and uh, how I'm going to actually integrate these requirements in the model. Well, the way we did it is, you know, basically by integrating the uh, team center active workspace in uh, system modeling workbench. What you see there is uh, active workspace inside uh, inside the product, and what you're going to see is uh, you know a way of uh, actually mapping uh, the requirements. So I have a requirements in Team Center. This is the requirement I, I, have, I have changed. Now I need to integrate these requirements to the model. So the way we're going to do that is you know fairly simple way. Great uh, user experience. I simply need to drag and uh, actually these requirements. We need a reality system that needs to basically cope with this information. Right? So, that's a quick preview, and I go back to the same in in the uh, consequences. Videos. So, what you have seen is all about uh, you know one-stop model access, um, you know connecting system engineers, reviewers, and stakeholders. We have capability of navigating and finding models in Team Center. You will find you know familiar model content navigation experience. Now, something I need to mention, in the current release of the product, we are not at this level of granularity. Um, right now, we are only representing the model levels, diagrams, we common situation. In coming versions, we are actually going to expand uh, the representation of the model. And what you will start seeing is actually the breakdown of systems, functions, and connections. And then, you know, this uh, navigation tree where you can navigate any of these objects inside Team Center. Available today, yeah, I can look at the any properties of the model, I can see the relative diagrams, I can do review and markup if I want to collaborate on uh, some system functions, whatever. I can open the model in the tool, so in that case, it's in W. I can create traceability, I can run a workflow if I want to maybe trigger a change on this model. I can see the requirement traceability to the models and objects, I can navigate the relations. So if this model is mapped to you know, other things and requirements, I can also look at that. And then uh, important as well, you know, where is that model used? Uh, which program, which project? So we have a where used capability so we can understand where it is used. That's uh, a quick summary of uh, the idea. Okay, so I'm gonna move next to connected engineering and um, I will probably start introducing uh, you know, some of the complexity as well on the connected engineering side. You know, we mentioned multiple times the complexity, the amount of data, its magnitude of millions, its RFAP and more. And then, you know, as an engineer, uh, not everybody is looking at the data in the same way or have a different interest, let me say, on the data. If you are a requirement engineer, well, probably you are interested by requirements. 
But if you are system engineers, you know, maybe your immediate focus is what you want to understand and maybe the function, right? Et cetera, et cetera, you know, electronic, justice, mechanical. So everybody is basically looking at the data in a different way. And why they want to look at the data in a different way? Because their needs is different. So it's pretty much as, you know, as many views as domains. Uh, and eventually, even inside the domain, could be multiple views. Uh, keep in mind that the view um, should be dynamic. You know, there's a lot of changes happening. So when I'm looking at a requirement view or in a functional view, when well, eventually this view needs to be dynamic to cope with changes. And then uh, automation. You know, these views, and I will explain in a minute why, this view should eventually be automatically created. I'm going to use a view to pass to an electrical, to a software. I'm going to use a view to run a simulation. Well, yeah, this is for the view. So you're going to need a way of automating the generation of this view and then passing this view and their data with the engineering domains and close the loop with the domain. How do we do that? Uh, we have this concept uh, called you know, recipes. Uh, a recipe is basically a way of uh, looking at the millions data, configure them, filter them out. You know, you can do that based on, uh, again, configuration. Configuration could be uh, variations, could be effectivity or revisions. And then, uh, you know, maybe some specific object types or relationship types, you know, you're only interested by some of them. So there's this way of specifying in a recipe something you can replay later on. You define, you define it first, but then you can replay it as you start you know, be using it. So you define the filter rules, you define the configuration rules, and then from this recipe, you can create the view. Okay? So that's a very important concept. This is quite uh, for recent capability in TeamSatter. And the reason we did that is, again, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, a very important and emerging need for automation. So we're going to automate the views uh, generation for various uh, engineering domains. So back to uh, product definition, I did mention that a couple of times, already multi-domain information model as a way of representing the RFAP and more. Comes with product configuration, you can manage the assets, so think about parameters, models, etc. It provides services, program change, workflow traceability. Then, like I said before, uh, we are integrating with system modeling tools. And uh, we are doing uh, that in a very uh, open spirit. So we integrate with systemic tools. We integrate, obviously, with SMW as our leading application. And then the question comes, uh, you know, how do I sell my engineering domain? So that's the view and the recipe concept I mentioned before. From this information model, there's a way of generating multiple engineering views, engineering views that are dedicated to specific area. For instance, uh, concept design validation you see on the upper right. I want to create a view to perform a continuous random simulation. Well, if I want to perform uh, a 3D CAD or CA simulation, the view is going to be different. I'm going to create another, etc., etc. So, as an example, and why there you see actually. What is uh, under the hood? Uh, well, obviously, some complexity. As an example, I want to show you uh, electrical. I want to show you how we can, from a system model that is integrated to Team Center, create a view, an engineering view, which is dedicated to a request I'm going to make to electrical engineers to create an electrical view. Let me show you that. So, right there, we are in uh, Mentor Capital. Mentor Capital is the Siemens uh, electrical design tool. What you see as well, uh, similarity, similarly to SMW, you see active or space embedded. Uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, common pattern we are applying to various engineering application integrations. Oops. And um, what you're going to see is uh, you know, basically uh, this, uh, this process, you know, starting with uh, Team Center Active or Space where I got uh, actually a system model integrated already. Uh, I'm going through there on the diagram tab. I know I think about uh, an electrical engineer that says, oh, what's, what's my starting point? Oh, this is the system. This is the system I need to implement in the electrical exam. So I'm looking at the system and uh, you know, kind of you know, potentially looking at the dependencies, relation to requirements, which is uh, what we're going to see next. 
we have this um, you know uh, graphical browser where you can uh, navigate uh, artifacts uh, and they have a relation to the other elements. I think why there the engineer is expanding and is expanding from the top and what you see there is actually other requirements uh, related to the system that were you know, uh, not in the system. So from this point, what I'm going to do is uh, basically import the system. And in that case, the, the view is generated behind the scene, so you don't see it. We are basically making the API calls to generate uh, the view, we call the recipe. And what it basically does, and it went a bit fast, so not only it created the view, it imported it, and then it automatically generates a starting point electrical design, which is the one, uh, the picture you see, the diagram you see on the screen. And that's, um, well, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, I started from a, in a, a system model. Uh, in that case, actually, I took the physical layer. I imported it into capital electrical design, and automatically it has been creating to me a starting point, which in that case is a functional starting point. But good enough, and not only good enough, but also aligned with the system specification. So this is the kind of automation we are looking at, you know, people call that generative design. And um, it's a matter of uh, you know, not recreate, recreating from scratch in each engineering domain, uh, you know, stuff that you have been potentially be defining earlier uh, during your you know, concept design and, and system model. Okay. So as I did that, um, Yes, uh, not only I was able to you know, automatically generate the starting point, I also imported the functions, my uh, electrical uh, design tool, and I also imported the requirements. Now there's um, something you're going to see in a minute, uh, there's a cross probing uh, kind of capability. So for instance, uh, if I will uh, you know, select the requirements in the capital tool, can also uh, you know click on it and directly see this requirements through the embedded active wall space uh, into uh, into uh, I can look at the text basically directly from the capital. Okay. Uh, let's accelerate a bit that thing. Now let's assume a minute that uh, okay it was my starting point design or I spent you know couple of days maybe refining and detailing this design. So the next thing I want to do is to close the loop. So I want to get back the design related to the system in the center. So what uh, the engineer just did, basically um, publish the design back in the center. And as you do that, it's getting automatically mapped. It's getting automatically mapped to the system that was the original system we started with. Uh, to create the starting point in the in the capital. So as a proof of that, um, you know, I'm basically back into the relationship browser. Right there, this uh, right guy is uh, my electrical design. And what do I see? Well, I do see it mapped to the SMW system model. Okay. So that's a simple example. But conceptually, what we did, you know, we started from the system model. System model was managing team center. As uh, add uh, you know uh, mapping to the requirements and maybe other artifacts, I import this system model into capital electrical design. It's creating automatically a starting point design, which is functional. I do my job, refine, publish back in Team Center, and everything gets back together. This is this is what we call closed loop. Okay. okay so uh, continuing with. Um, Product validation, and I think I'm running a bit out of time, so we accelerate a bit. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, you know a few things, and uh, maybe I need to go a bit faster. But you know, continuous verification and validation means what? Well, I did mention the scalability of uh, and the magnitude of verification. So you're going to need something to basically plan, orchestrate organize your uh, verification. So that's what we call verification planning, and we use the program management capability in Team Center to do that. Yes, there's a matter of requirements, test methods. What are they? How do I identify them? Same thing for the targets and parameters that need to be involved. Allocate to plan, reuse. You know, uh, I guess the example I was showing before was a matter of uh, reusing the system model 
for end-to-point design, but there's various uh, real use, uh, use cases you may think about, like maybe using a simulation model. You know? Not the first time I do this verification, I already have a simulation model that can be used. So we enable that and to retrieve what is reusable. Execution of verification, and then not least, you know, you've got to monitor and report across you know, multiple verifications, and then establish end to end traceability. So let me show you a quick example. Um, again, starting uh, you know, with a view on the left on the SMW model. In that case, we show sequence diagrams of the system. The system is an autonomous driving system. And especially the feature we are going to discuss is an uh, adaptive cruise control feature. So what we are simulating there is you know, basically uh, some new requirements. You know, we had an ACC part of the ADAS system, but eventually we need to augment this ACC with some uh, an additional capability. So in that case, uh, it's about you know, collision mitigation. And what I'm doing there is basically mapping my requirements uh, to the various levels of the system work. Okay, so with that done, uh, you know, as you can imagine, a system like an SEC, they have many verifications, um, and uh, you know, many verifications you need to perform, you know, multiple scenarios. So what you see there on the screen is a way actually to organize these verifications across um, multiple milestones of a program. And what's happening there is basically these verifications get associated to milestones. Basically saying, you know, at this particular milestone, I need to do this verification. Now, if I look at uh, this specific feature, adaptive risk control, again, you know, traceability, information model, what I can see is everything related to the feature. I can see what is verifying it, you know, verification request at the top, but also all the, you know, functions, requirements, etc., related to this verification that I need. Uh, that I need to use to perform the verification. Now, other things like uh, inputs and outputs. You know, typically in uh, verifications and the parameters are important for this matter, you're going to need to specify some settings. You're going to tell to the engineers where well, you need to make sure uh, you are in this range of these characteristics. So please use this parameter as a target. And similarly, uh, you may expect some measurements. You know, think about uh, maybe a breaking distance, uh, kind of emergency breaking for ICC. So what's this breaking distance? What is the objective? So you're going to get in return some parameters uh, that will act as an output out of the verification request. And what you start seeing there is actually what I said before, you know, everything that is related uh, to the request requirements, uh, maybe uh, some uh, regulation uh, requirements. And one of the things, uh, um, I just um, uh, open in that case is uh, a specific verification verification request, and what we're going to do next is basically uh, uh, issue uh, this verification request, run it through a workflow, so we can notify uh, engineers um, to perform this verification. So what the engineer is going through right now is uh, you know, basically uh, a way of uh, capturing inputs results. One other thing you can do as well with this capability is to create studies. So think about an SEC uh, verification. There's multiple scenarios you're going to need to go through. It's not necessarily separate verification requests. Maybe that's a verification with multiple studies. You know, daylight, night condition, uh, rainy condition, whatever. Right? So you're going to need to, or you may want to define the study. So in, in one single verification, you're going to perform multiple studies. And why you want to do that? Well, maybe because you want to do some trade-off. You want to do some optimization across uh, you know, various uh, maybe weather conditions, for instance. So that's what the, the person did. Uh, basically, uh, creating a number of studies. He wants to perform part of this verification. And there we go. Uh, we're going to now submit to a workflow, uh, which, in effect, is going to notify, in that case, the simulation engineer uh, and also, you know, provide a way of importing the data of this verification request into, in that case, uh, a, you know, a 3D simulation tool. So what you see there is a product called Prescan, and basically what it does is collecting all the data we gave, including the model, perform the parameterization of the model, and then run the simulation. And as a result of that, you know, you can start performing some comparison. 
at the end, verifications are rolled up back in Tip Center. Again, think about these thousand verifications. You need to track and monitor. What you see there on the screen is the result of this verification. And uh, if I go to a particular study, I can also look at you know my various studies, uh, you know, test conditions, and look at uh, the disposition, for instance, of the parameters. Did I achieve my objective? Did I achieve the target? That's what you see there. And what the guy is doing there is basically uh, filtering out, you know, clicking on the chart to see what is passed, what is failed, or maybe what is uh, without result. The next thing I want to show you quickly is, um, you know, this notion of trade-off. So in that example, we had a couple of studies. And uh, what is interesting is, uh, you know, when you think about the large set of parameters you need to deal with, uh, it's interesting to see maybe what are the differences between these parameters. So that's what's the comparison. Back to the program. Um, you know, I'm not showing that explicitly there, but, uh, you know, basically, we are rolling up back the verification and the results. The program. So the next time I go to the program and I look at the milestone, I can get back to the verification, click on the verification, and see what the status of this verification. That's what we call read-on uh, at the program level. Okay. So last example I want to show you uh, because we are now I talk about electrical design integration, which was the capital tool. I just show you integration to simulation. Again, all starting from this uh, system modeling definition and this uh, data that is managed in Team Center as a point definition. So another example there is mechanical. So this adaptive squeeze control uh, eventually was uh, requiring maybe to put together a new camera on the car because this uh, collision mitigation. And what you see there on the screen is basically uh, you know, a closed loop with uh, NX. Uh, which is our mechanical design tool. So right there on the on the right side, you see the geometry of the camera. What you see on the middle, again, it's a common pattern, integrating active more space into the tool. You see a way of cross-probing uh, parameters with the geometry. So kind of making sure parameters are right implemented and uh, are in the correct uh, you know, targets and range as specified by uh, the system model. Okay. So that's uh, was the last example. I wanted to show you in terms of uh, you know, closing the loop, integrating and making usage of system data downstream. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to conclude. So multi-domain public architecture, what are the benefits? Well, you know, we talked quite a lot about this concept of one single RFAP system specification for all, for all engineers across domains. Um, you know, how does it help? You know, again, plan for the next track engineering deliveries across domains, enforce a single specification common to everybody, or think about interfaces between functions. It's very important that everyone complies with the same interface. Uh, accurate and complete change in context of configuration. This is model based, so this is verifiable. Then continuous verification, validation, integration, and qualification, super key. Integrated with program, project planning, reporting capability. As I said in these three examples I've been showing you, we are mapping the results. So this is about mapping the evidence. If you are in the regulated industry, this is very important, right? You've got to, to be in a position at any point of time to provide evidence that you have been complying to the regulation. So you map the verification evidence uh, back to the information model. And then large scale. Um, you know, I mentioned the recipes creating these uh, engineering views automatically, pass them, automatically generate starting point design in the domain, where well, this is about automation. So we are, you know, pursuing that. We have a good starting point and we're going to keep going, providing more and more automation. Then not least, um, you know, you have seen some example. This is all the data at your fingertips. Go there in active workspace, you can create specific engineering views, you can configure the data, you can filter out. You can access pretty much all the data that are a concern for you, depending on your engineering role, directly from uh, you know, the active workspace uh, web plan. With that, uh, I think I'm done. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Okay, thanks, Pascal, for this presentation and for sharing some insight with us.
Um, well, uh, we don't have so much time for questions, but I, I, I hope people will have the opportunity to stay. Uh, anyway, so uh, we have a, a first question. I think you already provided an answer during your presentation, and especially during your last uh, example, but is your Capella installation connected to NX or any other PLM system? I'm not sure what connected means. Um, you know, in everything I explain, you know, you basically get system model data and being uh, the same W uh, system model data integrated to the center first. It's very important to have going through the center. So it doesn't matter of you know traceability in context, change, impact and exist, and multiple things where you want first to get the in the proper place in the, at the product level. From there, can consume, NX can consume, our simulation tools can consume, you know, our engineering tools can consume, software, Polarion can consume. This is the whole idea. So this is one place, you know, one stop shop for all the system LFP data in the team center that could serve multiple engineering domains. Okay, thanks for this answer. Second question um, Do you have the concept of functional chain in team center data model? Okay, so that's something, um, yeah, that's something we are working on. Um, as I said in one of the, the slides, um, I mean, today uh, we are representing models, diagrams, traceability to requirements, a few other things. Next, we development, the granularity of um, the representation of the model in the team center. And yes, the functional chain is part of it. So it's not currently available, but in time. Okay, next question. Um, the system's architecture was imported and reprodu reproduced via receipt in capital systems at capture. Can the same be done for system simulation environments? For instance, MATLAB uh, yeah. or Modelica? Yeah, that's the whole idea. And obviously, for a tool like uh, you know, MATLAB or Modelica, for simulation tool, the data are not going to be the same. You know, you may have interest in other things. So that's where, you know, typically you will have potentially a specific recipe, uh, you know, tapping into this information model, extracting, configuring the data for the simulation needs. But conceptually, yes, we mean the exact same thing. You will be able to execute this recipe, get the data in the simulation tool and make usage of the data in the simulation tool. Okay, next, next question is basically the same. Do you see a possibility to export architecture in any other type of tools? I'm thinking of system simulation architecture and model, especially. Um, so. Yeah, maybe something I need to mention, which I did not mention during the presentation. I don't think we can claim it's going to great with all the tools in the world. There are so many tools. So simulation space, modeling space, you know, it's hundreds of tools, and pretty much each customer, you know, has hundreds of tools. So, something you may have seen in the overarching view of MBC at Siemens, we you know, we have something called open API, and uh, we have this concept of what we call manager analysis, meaning that you know, people can go there in active or space, create their own recipes the views and then what we can do is to use our open API to collect the data to make uses of the data in any of their tools. So it's recurring a bit of problem but uh, you know it's open in a way that you know if uh, a tool for instance uh, that is uh, important to you and cement is not integrating with immediately well you can eventually use this API get the data to you to process the data and then return um, whatever needs to be so Open API also available uh, from this concept of view uh, Okay. Uh, next question is something we can hear very often. Uh, we use Polarion as a requirement tool. Is it already possible to use it in the presented framework? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is the question uh, well? Let me, maybe let me try and answer. Maybe somebody can chat on the, on the WebEx if it's not the right answer. But, um, well, I, I did not show Polarion at all. Um, I did mention at the beginning regarding requirements that 
there are multiple sources of requirements. At Siemens, yeah, one source could be Polarion requirements. Uh, you know, generally people will use Polarion requirements for software requirements, and that's perfectly fine. Now, there's a matter of integrating these requirements to the overall requirements, you know, think about product, mechanical, electronic, etc. requirements. So we have an integration with Polarion, we have an integration for quite long time. Uh, and then, and yes, we do integrate uh, requirements in this information model, requirements from Polarion, into information model and mentioned multiple times. So we have visibility and representation of Polarion requirements in the information model. Mm, okay, next question. What about the interfaces to electronic design and software design tools? What kind of interfaces can be used? Well, same information model. Now, obviously, uh, again, if you go to another domain, you're going to need to think about uh, different data. So if I go to electrical design, uh, well, I don't know, it might be some specific parameter that matters. Uh, it might be uh, some electrical characteristics uh, that matter. So, same thing. Well, you know, this information model it aims to serve all the domains. So, you're going to create a recipe. What do you want to do in electrical design? Well, I'm not too sure. Maybe you want to do a schematic design, right? Um, so you're going to extract the data from this information model to pass to your electronic engineer to do the schematic. Um, can we automate the generation of schematic would be a good question. I don't have an answer right now. I think it's very possible. It's a matter of you know, paying attention to it and how we can do it. And then same thing for other domains. We know we said software. Well, again, same process. Software is going to need other data. We can create a receipt. We can create a measuring use for whatever needs to be done on the software engineers. So it tends to be, uh, you know, again, very generic. And at the same time, powerful in the sense that uh, depending on the domain you are looking at, you have a way of actually extracting, configuring the proper data for the engineering task. Thanks. Next one. Well, pretty interesting question, in my own opinion. Uh, how is MBSC or Capella added uh, adding value if silos tool used in downstream application can be integrated with each other? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> well, no, I, uh, I did not understand the last part. Maybe just the last part. Um, okay, well, well, I will repeat the whole question. How is MBSC added value if silo, siloed tools used in downstream application can be integrated with each other? Okay. The, the question is uh, uh, what would be the difference between viewpoints and, and domains in Capella and, um, and applications uh, uh, you mentioned in your presentation? Well, again, this is the debate about point-to-point -point integration versus platform-to-platform. Uh, you know, -platform. um, well, you know, one of the key challenges uh, we mentioned at the beginning is uh, how do I coordinate across domains? Um, how do I make sure everybody is looking at the same thing? How do I make sure, you know, nobody misses a requirement? Well, again, you got to have a way of uh, you know, we, we used to call that in the in the in the old years that the single source of truth. Well, I think uh, the single source of truth is still very valid. Um, there's a matter of uh, you know getting all the data that matters uh, for engineering domains together in a, in a central representation, not necessarily in a central place, but in a central representation. So you can you know configure the data. You can do impact analysis. You can change consistently. Then, um, when it goes to um, asking somebody in an engineering domain to realize a system, to implement functions, well, you better have to make sure um, it's consistent with your other colleagues. You know, the things you're going to do are very likely going to impact your colleagues. How do they see that? Well, if you are a point to point integration, you know, and for instance, Capella talking to Capital and then uh, Capella talking to Polion in isolation. You're not going to cross the boundaries. You're not going to see the dependencies. You're not, not going to see properly the impact of uh, you know each domain uh, to the other. I, I hope it's understood. 
Uh, if it's not, <laughs> I'd be happy to maybe demonstrate that to the person that I could. Okay, uh, next question. I, I'm not sure of the question uh, concern directly Simons or Obio. Okay, uh, is possible in Obio, and I'm not sure to to properly understand what do, do they mean by Inobio. The implementation standard has ISO 19450, uh, and I think this is OPM, if I'm mistake. So maybe we can we can have two answers, one from your side, and I will have a, an answer for Bill just that. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so, um, well, I don't know for, for Siemens and SMW and so on, but if the question is, is there uh, possible using OBO technologies uh, like Sirius or any other technology enabling to create a modeling environment to create uh, OPM workbench? Uh, yes, definitely, we can imagine that. Uh, whether we actually don't have any plan to, to, to do that in short term. So if you're interested in, maybe we can we can discuss, but well, we, we are not actively working on this uh, on this uh, hypothesis. Yeah. Well, I think it will be interesting to know the motivation for this question, I mean, what, is, uh, what is behind it. But um, like some of you have said, I mean, I've seen the same thing. Well, we don't have any explicit offering regarding this, uh, this standard. I can't even say if it's possible or not possible. So maybe uh, maybe I'll require for Okay, next question. In order to implement the level of integration that you demonstrated, uh, what versions of Team Center, uh, SMW and Team Center do you do we need to use? Are there any additional plugins that are needed? Yeah, so, so this integration uh, for any team center uh, users is uh, available on the, our support uh, website, you know, called GTAC. And uh, you don't really need to ask yourself which, uh, which plugin and integration and which uh, SMW version for which activos like, version. It all comes together. You have a package which uh, you know, basically brings all the components together for a given version. So, we are supporting it since uh, um, uh, Active Host Space. Uh, I should not say this. I think we started in Fallout to one. My recommendation will be, uh, if, and if possible, that you use Active Host Space for the tree, which is the latest. And uh, and yes, I mean this is available on our support uh, website as long as you have a license. We can download it uh, all together, all uh, all components together from this website. Okay, and, and we go through the last question. Um, the idea to use the interfaces defined within the electronics architecture to be imported, reused in the electronic design tool. Uh, well, I'm not sure this is formally a question, actually. Um, at least I, I um, okay, I, I read and read this question, this question again. I, I don't understand it, maybe. You have an idea, Pascal, I don't know. Can you, can you repeat the question? I'll try to repeat uh, what, is, what is right. And, um, the idea to use the interfaces defined within the electronics architecture to be imported, reused, slash reused, in the electronic design tool. But, well, this is not really a question, so I'm not sure how you can answer that. No, but I think that's an interesting question in the sense that, uh, well, I'm glad people are seeing that, that uh, you know, the interfaces or the functional interfaces are, are, are really key. Because you're going to need every domain to uh, comply with this interface. It's kind of a contract. What you expect uh, the system doing and how do you expect functions interacting with each other across systems? So when it goes to electronics, well, same thing. They better have to comply with it. So yeah, I mean, it would be uh, certainly interesting to also import these uh, functional interfaces to, you know, to implement them and to make sure we, they are you know, properly and, uh, uh, aligned to the system definition, properly implemented and aligned to the system definition. 
Yep, that's um, that's the whole idea. Okay, thank you, Pascal, for all those in the information. Uh, you may have a question, but uh, we will conclude this uh, webinar now. And if ever you have some additional questions, please feel free to to uh, ask Pascal or, or, or me about that. And before to to finish, we will be grateful if you can give us some feedback about today. Uh, you, Leading the webinar, you will have a, a satisfaction form. Uh, please uh, fill, fill this form and express your opinion about, uh, about this webinar. And so, once again, uh, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. Um, and I wish you all a, a very nice uh, evening. Yeah, exactly. So, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, here's my contact information on this last slide. So, don't hesitate. Questions? clarification you need just to type it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.